to the Mido podcast. I'm Ashley. And I'm Megan. And today we have a guest. Her name is Brandy. And she's actually going to talk to us about Milan syndrome. Did I say it right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Brandy. Um, and my connection to Milan syndrome is that I am one of the co founders, but I myself also have a child who is affected or diagnosed with Milan. Um, my child's name is Dawson. He will be five at the end of September. And our journey started obviously um, the day he was born, but I would say probably around six months, um, his pediatrician became concerned with um, him not meeting milestones, the size of his head, and then just his low muscle tone overall. Um, so she, um, recommended that we go see a neurosurgeon. We went to the neurosurgeon. He pretty much just told us that Dawson had a big head and kind of dismissed. Um, but my mother instinct kicked in. So we went to see just a neurologist and the neurologist after doing some testing in office recommended that we go to see a genetic counselor. So once we went to the genetic counselor, they did again, some testing, and then they recommended that we get genetic testing. Um, and then we got Dawson's diagnosis of Milan syndrome. So that's kind of our journey. Um, the big red flag was him not meeting his milestones. Um, that kind of gave us the initiative, um, to seek further testing, um, to find answers. So I'll go into what Milan syndrome is. Um, for anybody that doesn't know, Milan syndrome is a rare genetic neurodevelopment disorder. Um, and it's caused by a change in the nuclear factor 1X gene. Um, clinical features of Milan, Milan syndrome vary, um, but could include or may include tall stature, stereotypical craniofacial features, um, for example, such as a tall forehead, long or triangular face, deeply set eyes, down slanting eyes, low set ears, small mouth that is often held open, thin upper lip, dental crowding. Also, um, another clinical feature of Milan syndrome could include intellectual disability, which ranges from mild to severe, um, large head circumference, low muscle tone, um, many different vision impairments, such as strabismus, opt optic nerve atrophy, um, optic nerve hypoplasia, limited fields of vision, um, cortical vision impairment or CVI, um, lack of depth perception, hearing impairment, um, speech delay and inability to speak, also delayed gross and fine motor skills. Um, some patients can have an enlarged aorta, which is the main vessel, um, excuse me, the main blood vessel that carries blood from the heart to the rest of the body. Also structural um, abnormalities in the brain, such as enlarged ventricles and underdeveloped corpus. Um, and I'm gonna say this wrong, so please, I apologize. Call it colossum. Colossum, that's right. Yeah. Awesome. Um, mm -hmm. Also, Chiari malformation, which is brain tissue um, protrude. It's when the brain tissue protrudes into the spinal canal, um, seizures or EEG abnormalities, skeletal ab anomalies, um, such as advanced bone age, scoliosis, sternum malformations, um, also joint hypermobility autistic like traits and behavioral challenges such as anxiety or mood swings. So I just gave you a lot of information about <laughs> what Milan syndrome is, um, but I wanted to make sure I included that just so for people who are listening, um, if they don't know what it is, they kind of have yeah, a little bit of a better picture. It's interesting actually hearing you reading it off because I'm sure a lot of our listeners are going to be like, wait, aren't you talking about Mito? <laughs> <laughs> because I would say probably 98% of everything that you read off is also a sign of Mito. So it's, it's nice to be able to hear that and, and have our listeners understand that there are other um, uh, syndromes or diseases or anything that, that are very similar. That's what makes it so hard to diagnose a lot of times. Yeah. Most that's, definitely. Like, yeah. And that's one of the things um, this just even hearing your journey, you know, it sounds so similar to what I went through with Troy. And obviously Troy was first 
diagnosed with mitochondrial disease with the same, the large head, um, you know, he was floppy, had hypotonia. We went to a neurologist, passed it off as nothing, you know, went to another neurologist and did a lot more testing. Um, and I think for children that have rare diseases, which Milan is even more rare than mitochondrial disease, that they just, they start their journey with so many different doctors and so many different, we're not sure, let's do this, let's do that, let's check, or they're okay. And um, we hear a lot of that with some of the other parents that we've spoken to. Um, but yeah, uh, Troy obviously has Milan, which I've mentioned on our uh, podcast that he wasn't diagnosed until about a year ago. Um, and obviously we talked about also, um, Brandy, when I was speaking to you earlier, that it wasn't discovered until 2010. So that goes to show that with these rare diseases, um, you know, genetics is moving along, but there are still so many more things to be discovered. So even when Troy, what did receive genetic testing when he was younger, it wouldn't have even shown up. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's quite, I think all parents can kind of come together when your child has a rare disease and you see the journey, you see the different symptoms and different things. And you're like, oh, you know, um, we have very similar, similar situations, so. And there's so many discoveries that happen from year to year that if you had yourself tested or your child tested five, 10 years ago, you might want to consider getting tested again because what we've found over the years has changed so much. And there's been so many discoveries like that, um, that it might, it might help. I mean, it also might not, but it might give you some answers to, to where you are. No, I agree. I think it's definitely important to always seek an answer or get tested because it is always changing and there's always new discoveries. And important, like what you said earlier, to listen to that mom voice. Mm -hmm. uh, when you just, you know, something isn't right or something is wrong or, or you just have that intuition, it, that's saying something, you got to listen to it. Definitely. And uh, I think one of the, oh, I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say one of the, you know, important reasons why I wanted to speak to you as well, Brandy, and bring you on our podcast is when you get a diagnosis um, and a new diagnosis, and obviously I had already been through this with mitochondrial disease and immediately going and looking up everything, you know, what is this, you know, who can I talk to about this? And it's just, you know, with rare diseases, sometimes that's hard to find. And when we got the Milan diagnosis, I was, you know, oh my gosh, what is this really? I've never heard of this, you know? And so it was so comforting to be able to find the foundation that you co-founded. Um, and I have literally in the last year learned so much just from that, because we, I mean, when you think about it, we only see our doctors like every six months, um, at least the specialists um, for, for me with Troy. Um, and there's just, you know, a lot of times there's not a huge amount of information. They don't even themselves have a lot of information. I know our geneticist said that she had one other patient that had um, Soto syndrome one, but not Soto syndrome two, which we didn't mention, but is another name for um, Milan syndrome. Am I correct with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, I was very thankful to find your foundation. And I think that that's important for parents to, you know, make sure that they look. And um, I just want to know where your journey started with the actual foundation, because this, it's such an important thing when you get diagnosed with a rare disease to have something like this to look for. Definitely. And I'm kind of just going to piggyback off of what you kind of touched based on. Um, but as you said, and like we were talking earlier, um, Milan syndrome was first identified in 2010. Um, and it is linked to a change in the NF1X gene. Um, before it was discovered, um, many patients actually were clinically diagnosed as SOTOs, like meaning they had char characteristics of SOTO syndrome, but they didn't have the NSD1 gene variant. Um, so I too, like when I first got Dawson di Dawson's diagnosis, I was like, where do I go now? But luckily um, the genetic counselor who helped to diagnose Dawson have, had heard of a Facebook support group. So it wasn't the foundation, this was prior to the foundation, um, but she had given me that information or told me about it. So I actually myself didn't have Facebook prior to Dawson's diagnosis, but as soon as we got his diagnosis, I slowly got into it just because like you type it in Google and not really very much comes up or did not come up at the time. So like my best resource was that support group to start because it was parents in similar situations 
that shared their journeys that I learned from. Like I, I learned what specialists to see and just all kinds of different stuff about what Milan is um, and things to expect. So um, it was two moms who started that support group of um, patients who have Milan syndrome. And then from there, um, actually four parents um, formed a committee um, and that's how we were able to create the formal organization of the Milan Syndrome Foundation. So we kind of all met through that support group um, and we just wanted to provide more for families um, just because we knew what it was like to be a, a family who had a child or in some cases an adult with Milan Syndrome. So we wanted to be that resource and that support so that when people got their diagnosis, they could go to a place like the foundation's website or the foundation's page and just get the information that they needed. Um, and just the connection or the feeling of not being alone. We wanted to provide that to families just because um, us as parents knew exactly what other parents would need and what they were going through. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why Ashley and I started this podcast was just so parents have, you know, a source of information, but also somewhere to listen to other people's stories. And um, I know that um, a lot of parents would probably consider starting a foundation. Um, so do you know the specifics? I mean, I have no idea. We, uh, Ashley and I and another uh, few mothers, we do a, a Mito, it's not necessarily a foundation. Oh my gosh, why am I forgetting the name of it? <laughs> the uh, Mito, research, Mito fund. research Fund. <laughs> And we put on um, a big 5K that raises money for um, Mito Research and um, stuff like that's super important, but a foundation, I wouldn't even know where to begin with something like that. So the first thing that we had to do, and um, actually in December of two, 2018, we registered as a nonprofit corporation um, in the state of New Jersey. Um, and then um, after filling out paperwork in September of 2019, um, we became a 501c3 tax exempt nonprofit organization. So that just allowed us to reach out to the community more um, and things like that. It just came with more advantages um, than just being registered as a nonprofit. That tax exempt status really allowed us to fundraise and, and things like that to help build our community and make it stronger. It's it, so with like, sorry, I'm trying to think of how what I know <laughs> and trying to compare it so that's easy for me to explain or understand. So through the Mito Research Fund, we're like attached to a school and that's what made us, that's how it was easy for us to become a nonprofit. But you okay. guys aren't, right? You're your own entity. Yes, we're our own. So basically we had to fill out um, paperwork, um, submit it to the IRS and they had to approve us um, and make sure that the foundation was legit and, and um, bylaws were in place and all kinds of really, um, I don't even know what to say, but just yeah. lots of different um, information that we needed to provide to the state of New Jersey so that they could verify that we met the qualifications to become tax exempt or to have that status for the nonprofit. So it always, whenever you say like you have to fill out paperwork or talk to the IRS, it automatically sounds super complicated. <laughs> is it really, or is it just like you have some paperwork you have to fill out and it's a fairly easy process? Um, to be honest, I wasn't too involved in that portion of it. Um, my other co-founders were, but I do know that it was hours and hours of paperwork and information that needed to pro be provided. So I do know it wasn't just a simple task. It definitely was hard work and lots and lots of information that needed to be um, proved so that they could, or so that we could get that tax exempt status. And I don't know if you already mentioned this, when did the foundation already actually start? Um, so that is a good question. I believe that we started in 2018. So it took a little while to get that tax exempt status. It's not something that happened quickly because you have to submit it. And then at times they can send it back and question certain aspects of it. And then you'll have to resubmit it, but it definitely is a drawn out process. Um, so it's not something that happens too, too quickly. So it's really only been a couple of years, which really makes your foundation super impressive because as a parent who came and looked for everything, you have everything from 
parent webinars that have doctors and specialists that I've been a part of and seen at least, I wanna say three. Um, I know you have more, I didn't get to see all of them, um, but you also have partners in all sorts of other countries that you're working with, doctors from other countries and um, gosh, what was it? You have parent education webinars was what I was just talking about, the family conference, which actually I was gonna ask you a little bit more about that. I know with COVID and everything, um, things have kind of been put on hold or difficult to arrange, but what goes into uh, a, a Milan family con uh, conference? What do you um, Well, it's, I mean, it's scheduling doctors or guest speakers um, to present during the duration of the conference. Um, it's making sure that we have a space available that's big enough to accommodate our numbers. Um, also a space that has rooms that we could, um, set up for different kind of um like breakout yes thank you i'm thinking webinars but it wouldn't be a webinar <laughs> no. just because that's on my brain um <laughs> but yeah like little breakout rooms where um they could offer different informational sessions depending on what um parents or families are interested in learning more about um we also had to consider child care um because a lot of families were bringing their children and then also um siblings but we know that our children are med medically complex so we also were looking to into a nursing staff coming in um just so that if anything did happen we'd have um somebody who is trained medically to be able to deal with a situation um i'm trying to think of of other things definitely guest speakers um definitely a hotel or some kind of um, space that could accommodate or house our families and then also um, space available for um, people to do breakout sessions just to learn more and then um, food like being able to organize like food. Um, I know we were trying to accommodate some families with some of the funds that we had um, just because for some it's harder to travel than others so just a whole bunch goes into sponsors. I know sponsors was a big thing um, to have at the time of, um, and we we did have one set out actually in New Jersey, but it did get postponed because of COVID. And we are looking um, into having one in 2022, I think between May and June, don't quote me on the May and June, but I know 2022. Um, so we're in the beginning stages of looking into um, different hotels and things that could accommodate our needs so that we can bring everybody together. That's going to be a really busy time for you, Megan. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, when we, that's when we do our Mito stuff too. <laughs> okay. That's okay. Honestly, this year is, um, I know you, you're uh, the Mito, Mito Foundation. I'm going to keep getting this mixed up. The Milan Foundation did the 5k as well. You did a virtual 5k. Yeah. The first okay. one, your first one this year, I think. Yep, it was our first one. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So that's exciting because that's kind of what we do. Um, so yeah, next year I'm definitely going to dedicate my time to uh, Milan because I feel um, with Troy's new diagnosis and we've been doing Mito for a really long time. Um, I'm going to do both, of course, but I really want to put forth some effort with the Milan 5K as well. So I'll be reaching out to you guys to see if you need help with that um, when that comes around again. That would be uh, great. Yeah. Uh, you usually like do you reach out for like volunteers for help on any of your events um so usually what we do is we'll like post on our um foundation page um about the event and for this particular one the virtual 5k um we just open it up to different families to be able to form teams um and set their fundraising goals and we had like an overall fundraising goal that we wanted to meet for the event um but like for example i had team dawson so like some of my closest friends and family members donated and joined team dawson and then we met at a local park and then we kind of did our um 5k together there and just took pictures and posted um so i think a lot of other families in the community did the same thing they kind of just created their own team um and then set up a location where um close friends and family could join. And then anybody who didn't feel comfortable joining in person or who couldn't join, um, they could actually do their walk, run, roll um, anytime between um, August 2nd and September 19th, I think. I'm terrible at dates, I apologize. <laughs> um, but they could they could do it anytime between um, that window and then they could share it to that person. So like for example, 
if my grandmother did the event, but not actually in person with me, she could post herself walking and then share it to my foundation, or my Facebook page. And then I could share it to the foundation. Right. Awesome. So we, we, um, we were super impressed and in, in all of our community um, with that event because it really was very successful. Yeah, definitely. And fun. <laughs> Good. Yeah. And then um, one of the last things I wanted to talk about with is that um, the research grant programs. Um, so that's another impressive thing to me with the Milan Foundation only being around a couple of years is that you literally have set up um, research grants and you're funding research grants. And I thought that was super impressive because we're a part of the UMDF, which is the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation. And they're huge and have been around for, for quite some time. Um, and you know we see all their research grant proposals at the symposium that they put on. And I was very impressed that you guys are actually reaching out and doing that well, as well and funding grants as well for research. So that's pretty amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna... Um give Crystal a little shout out here because she's our science guru. So, I mean, she is, she is really amazing and has been all over the research aspect of our foundation. Um, just, I mean, since we're on the topic of, of research, here are some of like our current research projects. So we, we obviously have the patient registry, which we have 80 patients enrolled. Um, just want to say it since we're talking about it, it's super, super important that if you have um, a child or an adult in your family diagnosed with Milan syndrome to make sure that you get their information into the patient registry because it's so important for research. Um, we're starting a bio re, um, repository, which um, is going to make patient cell lines available to researchers around the world. Um, also, we have three ongoing clinical studies, um, one on epile ep epilepsy, excuse me, and Milan syndrome, one looking at communication in Milan syndrome, one looking at neurobehavior, um, such as um, sensory processing, life skills and behavior, um, cognition and Milan syndrome. And then also this year, we funded two additional research projects to advance our understanding of the gene associated with Milan syndrome and develop a potential therapeutic strategy. So those are just all the exciting research um, events that are happening and taking place within our community. And it, it's very hopeful to hear that because as with Mito and Milan, there's no cure at the moment and you know, not necessarily treatments in the sense of, I don't know, I don't wanna say medicine, but um, obviously there's behavioral therapy and there's you know, different therapies and things like that, but it's a, very similar with Mito. We just have supplements that um, our kids can take, but there's definitely not a cure. So it's always hopeful to know that there's research going into this to um, get doctors involved and researchers to hopefully find more information, you know? Yeah. So. I mean, and definitely just to provide a better quality of life, you know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for joining us today. Is there anything else that you wanted to add or anything that we maybe forgot to ask? Um, the only other thing um, is just, there's lots of resource, resources and um, parent support events. So I just wanna kind of touch base on those. So yeah. anybody listening um, might be interested, um, but we do have a professional guide that's available through our website and that's milansyndrome.org. Um, the guide provides um, anyone who would like to learn more about Milan syndrome with what it is, um, community members, family members, friends. Also, if you attend a medical conference or a rare disease event, um, you can hand the guides, guides out to help raise awareness. Um, it is available to print on our website. Um, we also have a YouTube channel that you can subscribe to. Um, if you are able to register with our Family Connect. Um, you can view webinars. Um, we've had a, quite a few webinars available to our families. Um, we also have something called WhatsApp. It's a parents only group. Um, every month we have uh, parent social happy hours. Um, we also have a conference and special events Facebook page. Um, so you can find information on our socials and things like that through this Facebook page. Um, and then we do offer a teen, young adult, so 13 and up um, social hour for individuals as well. 
So I just wanted to put that out there for anybody um, who might be interested in those things. Yeah. And I think too, for our parents that are listening, parents are extremely powerful. Ashley and I have talked about so much how we've learned so much more from the people that we have spoken to and the parents that we've spoken to that you know, have the different diseases that our children have. And, you know, if you are out there and you want to start a foundation or start fundraising or things like that, parents are powerful. And um, I think that's really important to know. Obviously, parents started the foundation. Well, most of the foundations, I think, are actually UMDF was started um, by parents, too, quite some time ago. And, uh, you know, it's just you can put your power to work. (laughs) Well, I feel like, like you said, we're able to be our child's voice like when they don't have a voice, um, I mean, we're their biggest advocates, you know what I mean? So you're right. Our words and our work are definitely super powerful and they're, they're life-changing. I mean, you know what I mean? Like what you guys do is amazing. Like anybody who starts up a foundation in the rare disease community, I mean, it's just, it just says a lot and it can go a long way. Definitely. And then also for the parents out there too, that, that don't want to start a foundation or don't, don't have that as the, the passion that's like on the forefront, just your volunteering or doing a 5k or getting involved in somehow, it really helps with, um, being able to just kind of calm your feelings about what's going on in your life. Um, yeah. it's really hard. We always talk about this. It's always hard to get this diagnosis. And a lot of times you just feel helpless and you don't know what to do. You want to do something, but you just don't know how to put your energy out there and, and finding a foundation that resonates with you and helping in any way whatsoever. Again, even if you're just signing up to do a 5k, it it helps, it helps a lot. And it it helps to, it's almost, for me, it's like therapy. If I didn't have the 5k or matter research fund, I would have been totally lost. Um, so if you are listening and you don't want to start a foundation, or if you do go start one, even if it's small, (laughs) um, or at least just find one that you feel that you can, you can put some effort into. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time and talking with us. And Megan, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I think, you know, I think we pretty much covered anything, everything. Um, I appreciate you, yes, speaking with us, Brandy, and um, I'm hoping I get to speak to you a lot more at some point. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> I navigate this disease with Troy, so. <laughs> well, I mean, reach out anytime, because I mean, that's the purpose of our foundation is just to support families, you know, and I mean, it, it, you can, you can get really far with support, so I mean, definitely reach out if you have any questions. Um, Our website is a really good resource full of information and also um, our Facebook group, if you have the opportunity to join it, um, there's um, information shared all the time. So definitely. Well, thank you again. You guys are listening to the Mido podcast. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram. You can go on our YouTube channel. If you have a suggestion for a podcast that you want to listen to or someone you want to talk to, or if you want to be on here with us, um, you can email us at mitopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you.